Today's reading comes from Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 14 and 19 to 24. Um, I'm going to read it slow, mostly because there are a lot of details we're going to point out this morning, friends, that I want you to catch before I point them out. So if it seems like I'm reading a little slower than normal, that's on purpose. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, from each, man, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, take 12 stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each one of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, when your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them there, laid them down there. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. For the priests bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people. According to all that Moses had commanded Joshua, the people passed over in haste. And when all the people had finished passing over, the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people. The sons of Reuben, the sons of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel, as Moses had told them, about 40,000 ready for war before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all of Israel, and they stood in awe of him, just as they stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal, on the east border of Jericho. And these 12 stones, which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. He said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know, Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Let's pray. Jesus, what a passage. What a time for us to arrive at this passage. Lord Jesus, speak to us today. It's what we most desperately need. To speak, be in our midst. O Holy Spirit, reveal to us our Lord and our Savior and all that he has for us this morning. Will we not shy or shirk away from it? Will we not give in to apathy or fear? But Lord, will we find that your voice, your presence is so clear in this place, not of our own doing, out of my words, because you're that good to us, and you long to be that near to us. What we find in that precious place, in the beauty of your presence, we are changed. 
We ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. My customary sip of water. For those who I have not had the privilege or pleasure of meeting, my name is Tommy Bello. I'm the youth and young adult pastor here at All Souls Community Church, and I want to extend my welcome to you as well, either in person or online. For those of you who are new or newer, welcome. For those of you who are regular attenders, welcome back. And for those of you who are members, welcome home. We are really glad you're here. This morning, we're going to continue our series in the book of Joshua that we have been calling Fighting for Our Inheritance. And before we start diving into what I just very slowly read for us, there's a story I have to tell you. It's a bit of a funny story, but it's a bit of an appropriate story. All my life, I have been fascinated with nature. When you really get down to not just the science of it, but the creativity and the art that is imbued in nature, you find that it is way more complex and way more stunning than we ever realize. I remember spending many an afternoon in my backyard growing up, sitting on the top of my shed, looking out at the clear blue sky uh, because the planes that would take off from Newark Airport would fly directly over my house, no matter what direction they were actually going in. So on certain days and on certain afternoons, I would just lay on that shed and watch every 15 to 20 minutes, plane by plane go by, marveling at the majesty that how do those metal tubes even stay up there in the first place, and I still don't know, but also just the wonder and the grandness of that big blue sky, so close yet so far away. And there are little moments like that that we'd experience all over. When you take a shovel and you dig into dirt, do you realize you are disturbing an ecosystem that is more complex than even our own? Do you know that when you look at a leaf or leaves on a tree, how they wither, at what point do they wither? Yes, it's absolutely due to weather, but it's actually even more complex than that. That a tree actually knows when a leaf needs to go. Nature is insanely beautiful and insanely complex. And it's one of those things that I realized without ever knowing it or not at a very young age. And one of the things that became very apparent to me in my growing up is that nature was one of the few places, not just meditating on nature, but being in nature was where I would sense God and his presence. For some of us, that's something we understand. For some of us, I can see the head noddings of being like, yeah, I get it. I know exactly where you're going. Um, besides nature, there's always been a reoccurring theme of my life of rocks. I don't like rocks in particular. They don't really hold like a special significance for me. But everywhere I've lived, there's always been a monument, a stone stack, if you will, in the woods, on a running trail, everywhere I've lived. And I've always carried a desire in my heart to build my own stone stack. Joshua 4 is a story I've known for a long time in my life. And as we're going to talk about today, they build an Ebenezer. They build a memorial stone stack. But I always wanted to partake in that myself because it felt something, there's something really powerful, really spiritual, and really deep about partaking in an activity like that. I can never fully explain it with my own words, but my spirit sensed something that God's spirit was trying to tell me, that this was important. And so a few months ago, oh, I built one. There we go. I felt God calling me to a spiritual boot camp this summer. And one of the things he very made clear to me was, you've been longing to build an Ebenezer, so build one. And I went, okay. This is by some woods in my house. And I would go there um, either in the early mornings or after the girls were at camp. And I would take a lawn chair and I would take a bunch of clothes that I didn't mind getting dirty in because sometimes it was nice and pleasant, sometimes it was super muddy and damp. And I would take a chair, and I don't know how well you can see it, but I would sit on the edge of the river. And I would just sit there with my Bible, and I would just sit and wait for Jesus to come meet with me. And it was part study, part prayer, part worship, part silence, part, I don't know how to describe it really. But each time I met with God, he made it very clear to me, go build that Ebenezer, take a stone out of that river, and build a memorial stone stack to me that I have met with you in this place. And I thought, wow, how cool. I didn't get to build it as big as I wanted to. It's still a work in progress. But I got it to a point where the picture may not do it much justice, but there are hundreds of stones in that stack. 
Why am I telling you the story about me building some stones and probably displacing some ecosystem in the middle of suffering New York? <laughs> because ironically enough, I started building that stone stack in June. June, four months ago, before I knew we were gonna be in Joshua, before I knew I was gonna preach this sermon. Right, like we love to talk about these like little like, oh, that, what a coincidence. Oh, there are no coincidences when it comes to God's work. None at all. You can imagine how my mind was blown as we're sitting at staff meeting and, okay, we started looking at the sermon map and I scroll down on this document and I see this week, this passage, it's me. God's up to something. Friends, we have been looking at this idea that God is calling his people to an inheritance that he has prepared for them. And in the weeks that have passed, we looked at these ideas that for this inheritance to actually be ours, we must be ready to be strong and courageous. I want to remind you, though, that this strength and courage is not one that we well up in and of ourselves. When you go back and read Joshua 1, he is reminding them that they can be strong and courageous because the Lord your God goes with you and before you. God is not asking you to well up something in your hearts and your minds that you have to fabricate. We cannot ever simply just overcome our fear and replace it with courage of our own design, of our own doing. God says, I'm going to be the one that does that, so be ready to be strong and courageous. But not only that, this idea of fight for each other. Right? I talked about this group project, that the way we live our lives, the principles and the values that we uphold are not just about me, myself, and I. The older you get, the more you realize it doesn't really matter how I live my life. If I believe it only affects me, I'm a fool. Because it absolutely affects every single person around me. And so yes, God is saying when we are going to receive this inheritance that he has for us, we must fight, not with, but for each other. But then this idea of living like Yahweh rules, how we pray in the Lord's Prayer on earth as it is in heaven. God rules in heaven. Do we want him to rule on earth? Not just in our own personal lives, but in all of the dominion that we can call this planet. Do we live like this is all Yahweh's? Do we actually let that affect our day to day? This morning, friends, we're going to look at the purpose of these stones that God instructs his people to stack. And there are four points that we're going to go through. These stones are going to teach us that we must remember, that we must instruct, that we must witness, and we must declare. What's really cool about this is they kind of happen in couplets. So the first two are going to be maybe a little obvious and maybe a little shorter, but nonetheless not as powerful as, or less powerful than the other two. But these other two, when we get to there, oh, strap in. It's going to be good. So, here we really go. Joshua 4 is the continuation of one long moment in chapter 3, where the priests are holding this Ark of the Covenant in the middle of this river. The waters have been pushed back to how we saw last week, to the beginning, Adam, and to what would be the end, hell, death, the grave. And God's people have now started to pass over on dry ground. It is a pretty astounding story. It is a pretty confusing story. Because this is the Jordan River in springtime, near where Jericho is. Jericho, today, which is literally one of the oldest cities on the planet. It's the same site that it was all the way back in our biblical times. You look at that and you go, why don't you just swim? Right? It doesn't look that wide. It doesn't look that deep. If you remember, there's this curious little detail in chapter 3 where God wants his people to remember the snowbanks have melted. The Jordan almost swells to 10 times its length and width and depth when the snowbanks melt. You can imagine the torrent of water that that may be. This is no river that they can just swim across. They can't even touch the bottom, let alone any livestock they have, let alone any kids they have that don't know how to swim. So when God puts the priest with the Ark of the Covenant smack dab in the middle of this river, friends, have no doubt, it is a crazy miracle. But the story goes on from there. As Israel is passing over and once they are completed, Joshua gets these divine instructions. It's the first time this ever happens in the Old Testament, where God tells them, tells him to tell them, build me an Ebenezer, 
Build me a, a memorial stone stack. Mark the very ground upon which you have walked on. To have it, be, have it hold a sign of what has happened here today. We understand this idea of memorials and tokens because uh, if you go to a funeral, a lot of times you hold on to the program or you hold on to the pictures you have of that person. Same thing is true when you go to a wedding, we get wedding favors. It's cool to get a nice little gift, but it's also to help you remember what celebratory thing happened that day. But family vacations, promotions, other things like that, very often we will get postcards, little trinkets or whatever, because that thing is supposed to help us remember all that happened that day, all that that day stands for. It's a, it's a concept we're familiar with, but this takes it to a whole new level. Because what God is helping his people, both then and now, to understand is the spiritual importance of remembrance. Psalm 52 says, I will thank you forever because you have done it. Past tense. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. Past tense. Has done it. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. Well, God is great like our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. That's the continuation of Psalm 77. Past tense. To if any of you remember the Lion King, that moment where Simba is really wrestling with going back home or not, and he's on the plains of the savannah and it's dark, and he sees Mufasa, his father, in the clouds. Do you remember what he says at the very end before that vision of his father disappears? Remember. Specifically, he says, remember who you are. Remember. Here's our first point, friends. God uses these stones to call us to remembrance because we tend to forget. And I don't just mean, oh, I'm getting older and some things kind of leak out. Yeah, that happens, unfortunately. That will not be once heaven comes. But we tend to forget and forgetting normally isn't that big of a deal. Sometimes, just last week, for example, not even last week, yeah, last week, my daughter forgot her homework in her backpack. So we took it to the school. Not that big of a deal, it happens. Sometimes you forget where you pay your car keys or your phone, that's me, I forget all the time. Usually that's not that big of a deal, sometimes it is, right? Forgetting where your kid or your dog or your relative was, a little bit more of an important deal, right? So, you know, there's, some, there's a spectrum here that's varying, but this, when we forget what God has done, is deadly. Here's why. When we forget, we start to doubt. God, what have you done? Have you been around Jesus? Have you been working in my life? Have you been working through me? We start to doubt. That poisonous seed that wants to ruin the garden of the faith that Jesus is cultivating in us starts to spread its weeds and kill the roots that are laying underneath. We start to doubt. And this doubt creates a barrier, one that is of our own doing and of sin's doing, not of God's doing, between us and him. It creates a foggy mirror, dirty lenses, that we start to see God in a way that is not actually true of who he is, but we can't see otherwise because our lens is foggy and dirty. We start to doubt. And eventually it leads us to this idea that he can't do it. Whatever the it is. In this passage specifically, God can't lead us into the promised land. He can't do it. The inheritance that he has promised us already, that he has already said is ours, he can't do it. Something's off there. It's a he's lying or it's gonna, he's going to get robbed from us. Just something's not connecting here. When we forget, it may seem dramatic, but I guarantee you, and we actually will have a moment to do this later, when you allow yourself to let God remind you, you will be surprised at all the things that he has done in your life that have fallen to the wayside. And you go, oh, how could I forget? And God says, I don't want you to. Remembrance, not just a good idea, but this important spiritual principle. But then the chapter goes on. Twice, we see Joshua say to the people, be ready for when you are asked this question, what do these stones mean? It's a reason, there's, 
There are a lot of reasons why God calls children a blessing in the Psalms. One of them is because a lot of times they will ask the questions we are afraid to ask. No kid who trusts that their mom and dad is going to listen to them and feel safe enough to ask a question doesn't ask the question. Joshua's letting them know ahead of time, be ready to answer this question, what do these stones mean? Because the answer is super important. They give three answers in this passage, most of which are found in that second part we read, 19 to 24. But he says, the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of the Lord, was the one that went into the river and parted the waters. Be ready to tell the children in your midst that these stones remind us God was here. God moved in our midst. That this miracle wasn't a bunch of hocus-pocus nonsense psychobabble. It happened. I felt the wind and the wave of the waters. I felt the mist come off of water that was higher than me and yet somehow not even touching me. It's connected to remembrance. He wants them to remember this very clear, important idea. This wasn't just some miraculous thing that God in heaven went, boom, look at that, you got it going on. No problem, walk across the river. He wants them to remember with these stones, Jesus saying, I was there. I, part of the water. I am the one who made a way through. I am the one who has always held my promise to my people and I never not will. But not just that, it's a callback to the Red Sea, which he literally says, but you have to imagine for a people who 40 years earlier have heard the stories, maybe even were little kids when it happened, of God's people crossing a, a giant sea to then, then experience it for themselves. It's hard to put into words how powerful of an impact that is. And God wants those kids of many ages to receive the blessing of that moment in time. It's part of the reason why some of how you see the sanctuary outlined this morning is a little different. There's a Blue River duct tape or scotch tape in the middle. What's up with that? I'm not wearing any shoes. What's up with that? <laughs> There's a stone stack here. What's up with that? <laughs> All of our teenagers that normally sit in the top right aren't sitting there. What's up with that? All of this has to do with what we're talking about now, except the shoes. That's a different thing. <laughs> but then the last reason that Joshua gives them is this idea that these stones point to the fact that the hand of the Lord is mighty. And keep in mind, it is very particular language that God uses here. We would like to think that God is saying to his people, hey, so that Israel, you will remember that the hand of the Lord is mighty. Nope. It's not what he says. What he says is so that all the peoples of the earth, everyone, may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. What are we getting at with all this? Our second point. God uses these stones to call us to instruction because our children will only know God if we tell them about him. If our children don't know about God, that's not their fault. That's ours because we have not remembered and we have not instructed. Teenagers who got my text this morning, it's why you're not sitting in the top right. It's why I asked you to sit with your biological or your trusted spiritual family because you're sitting next to the people whose very responsibility is to take this seriously. But not only that, the people in this room and the people online and the people who are part of this congregation who are watching on YouTube and Facebook after the fact are being held to a responsibility that God deems so important. He says, pick up stones and mark the earth. That's how important it is. Because, friends, the inheritance we are set to receive is not just for us but it's for the generations that precede us. We see that in Joshua 4, specifically in verse 7 that we just read. But when we read passages like Exodus 34 and Deuteronomy 7, where God says, to those who will follow faithfully my commandments, they will be blessed to the thousandth generation. But for those who stray and work against me, their families are cursed to the third and fourth. God takes this whole generational blessing, generational curse, spiritual legacy, very seriously. 
very seriously. Which is why the other thing I have to say about this is not just why do we buy the excuse that the spiritual upbringing of our children belong to other people. That's one point. Hear that. I bring that up a lot. But here's another point that goes right along with that. Kids, no matter how old you are, if your parents are still alive on this planet, whether you are 10, 15, or 60, and your parents are still alive, if your parents are parents of the faith, or you have adults in your life who are spiritual parents to you, they could be teaching you anything. They could be teaching you how to be a good citizen. They could be teaching you patriotism or loyalty to your country. They could be teaching you how to do your taxes and change a tire, and hopefully they do, but I'm pretty sure that's not gonna take 18 years of education. Maybe taxes. <laughs> they could be teaching you so much, and yet this is what they bother teaching you. Why? I know sometimes, especially when we're young, we get into our heads that our parents don't know as much as we think they know. Friends, my beloved youth group students, I love you, and God does not agree. God does not agree. He wants us to actually listen to what our parents are telling us because he knows it is right and it is good. And that mantle of parenthood and spiritual instruction he has given unto them. You have the parents you have for a reason. If you're going to be parents, you will have the kids that you have for a reason. If your kids are already out of the house or older, you have the kids that you have for a reason. And so, friends, for us to take seriously this idea that God wants to instruct not only just our biological kids, but the generations that come after us about who our God is and what he has done so that all the peoples of the earth may know is a big deal. It is a huge deal. And if you're like, oh, I'm 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, my kids are not out of the house. Notice I said the generations that come after you. So I can give you a very concrete example. Men who are older than me in this room, you better be teaching me. You better be. If you're on the upper, upper, upper scale, I'm going to pray that God sends us some 100-year-olds <laughs> so that everyone's covered. <laughs> but this is super key. Now, these are the two points that go hand in hand together, and they seem kind of very obvious. When people talk about this passage, these are the points that they normally bring up, and they are right and good. They are simply not all that God is up to in this passage. There's one little detail. Hmm. That's not true. There are a lot of little details that jump out at this passage, but here's one of them. How many memorial stacks did they build? Two. Two. God tells Joshua to take 12 men, one of each tribe, a symbol of unity, a symbol of togetherness. We go through this together or we don't go through this at all. And he tells them to pick up stones and put them on his shoulders. Do you know how big those stones are? Those aren't stones, those are boulders that they, wait, we're talking heavy suckers and go and march out of the river and boom, stack them. Probably like a six and a four, and you know, something like that. But stack them. That's the one. But then you read right in the middle of the, of the chapter. It seems like a little detail that you just kind of glance over and you go, huh, what's actually going on there? And now I lost this, so give me a second to find it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, I lost it, but it's in there, I promise. Joshua builds a stack. Joshua builds a stack by himself. He picks up 12 boulders by himself, and he marks the spot where the Ark of the Covenant was. What is up with that? What, Joshua, why did you feel the need to do that? You just felt like doing extra homework? Like, boulders are heavy, guy. Like, what are you doing? Or is Joshua onto something? Is Joshua so moved by the presence of his Lord and Savior there in that moment that he knows as Yahweh, that we also know as Yahweh, but that we also know as Jesus? Working and moving in the midst of his people in that moment. Why bother to take these boulders and build another Ebenezer memorial stack in the middle of the river? Psalm 77, which we read a bit about earlier, 
It says, your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. Psalm 77 and large does a good job reminding and rehearsing what God did when he led his people through the Red Sea. It is a retelling of that instance in time. But this one verse in particular stands out for a very interesting reason. Your path led through the sea. That's the Red Sea. That makes sense. Your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. The psalmist here seems to have a healthy expectation that his footprints should have been seen. What's up with that? Our third point, friends, is that God uses these stones to call us to bear witness about him. It is my firm belief that even though it's not explicitly recorded in Joshua 4, Joshua, the leader of God's, the earthly leader of God's people at this point, senses the call of his God to mark in that river where God was as a witness so that it would stand before all who walk, upon, walk by the Jordan River for all time on. God was here. You wanted a sign? Here he is. Because the verse tells us, and those stones are there till this day. Just like it says in Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do we see the callback? It's so important, friends, that we hear, that we bear witness to what God is doing and where he is. Because when we don't know where God is, we feel hopeless. We do. We absolutely do. If you've ever had a moment in your life where you've cried out in some way, shape, or form, God, where are you? It's because you feel like God has left you or abandoned you or forsaken you. And in that moment, if you don't have God, if you don't have something and someone who can break into the situation that you're experiencing to actually help see you through it, because you are cognitively and instinctually and mentally and emotionally aware that you aren't getting out of this by yourself, and he's not there, you have nothing. You are hopeless. It's devastating. And God knows that we are privy to this because of the broken world that we live in. And so Joshua... Bearing that mantle of leadership, hears the call of his God and says, no, 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 no. Those stones over there, that's not enough. I'm putting stones right here. God, you were here. Your presence was here in that Ark of the Covenant and on that mercy seat. God, you were here. The parting of the waters is proof of that, but so too will be these stones. God, you were here. May I never forget and all you have to do is read the at tail end of Joshua, 23 and 24. Joshua never forgets. Jesus goes with him. It's why they say, not once, not twice, not three times, but four times in Joshua 1 and Joshua 2, be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God goes with you. It's not just a slogan we want to put on a banner and say, this makes us feel better. No, it is an actual spiritual reality, more real than air and the water you drink to keep you alive, that God goes with you. And just like we've been talking about in the weeks that have come and in the weeks to come, the spiritual and the earthly are much more closely entwined than we dare to imagine. But where do the stones come from? We're getting to our fourth and last point, and it's a doozy. Where do those stones come from? They come from the river. Not around the river. Not over there, and they carried them. The river. The surging, raging, crazy water river. Huge boulders that they took out from muddy, silt, sand surface. Up and out. And for Joshua, up and over here to wherever the priests were standing. They came from the river. It's a detail that is said over and over and over again in the passage that we read this morning. We know that's only possible because the waters parted. But is that all that matters when it comes to looking at where these stones come from? What about why did they put the stones on the west side of the Jordan? I'm going to turn around for this part just because it's going to be confusing for me to try to explain this to you, facing you, and our directions are opposite. But when they cross into the promised land, they're over here, and they cross west, and they put the stones here. 
east to west, opposite of the rising sun. No, same thing as the rising sun, sorry. <laughs> they put the stones here on the west banks, on the eastern shore. That's what our passage says. Why there? Why not there? Still marks the same thing that happened, right? Joshua kind of does his own thing, and he takes care of the middle option, so that's not an option. But why there? Is it really that important? Oh, yes, it is. Last week, we looked at this idea of the sons of God. Genesis 6. The spiritual image bearers that God so decreed would reflect him in the spiritual realm, just like we, as the earthly image bearers, were to reflect him in this realm. And unfortunately, because of Adam and Eve, but it would have been any of us, and unfortunately because of all the people in Genesis 6, both sides are waging war against their Yahweh, their creator. So what do Genesis 10, Genesis 11, and Deuteronomy 32 have anything to do with why, why it's important these stones came from the river and why it matters it's on the west side? I'll tell you why. Genesis 10 and Genesis, Genesis 11 mark two interesting passages for us in the history of humanity. It is the table of nations, those 70 nations. If you remember, when Jesus sends out the 70, a call back to the 70 nations who would have rebelled against him, who spiritually disowned their heavenly father. But also Genesis 10, uh, Genesis 11, excuse me, it's the Tower of Babel. It's where human, humanity decided, let us build our own holy mountain. We can be gods. We don't need you. And let's go up and up and up and up until we reach a place that is very clear to not just us, but to everyone who can see who needs our divine. We are divine. And these passages make it very clear that God sees how humanity and those sons of God are doing the true, rebellious, prideful act of wanting to not only replace him, but be done with him. It's the story that, of the prodigal son that says, Dad, I'd rather you be dead so I could have my inheritance now. It is, friends, and I do not mean this crassly, I mean this honestly, a giant middle finger to God. That's what's going on in Genesis 10 and 11. We don't need you, so get out of the way. Here's the interesting thing about God. It's one of the things I most love and respect about him, but it's also one of the things that makes me quiver. And Deuteronomy 32, 8 to 9, it says this, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, what have we been talking about? Fighting for their inheritance. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, that happens at Babel, and it happens at Genesis 6, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the portion is his people, Jacob, his lot at heritage. What does that have to do with anything? It's the introduction to this idea that when we talk about not just generational curses, but territorial places of spirits, territorial land that does not belong to Yahweh, we see this play out in passages like Deuteronomy 32. Now, for some of us, the first thing that comes to mind is, wait, doesn't the whole earth belong to God? It seems kind of weird that now there are these other fixed borders of places that somehow don't belong to God. That seems like bad theology, and I would agree. Except the problem is, in order, to be, in order for that land to have been given away, it needed to be owned first. It doesn't say that the sons of God pillaged and robbed and took from God what was rightfully his. No, it says God gave it away. What, is we, what are we getting at there? What's the thing that causes me pause sometimes, but I love and respect about God? So often, friends, we want to come up against the ways and what God is doing in our life and in our midst. And somehow, we, in some ways, we decide that we know better than you, God, or I don't need you, God. You know what God says sometimes to that in return? Go ahead. Let me know how that goes. They didn't want anything to do with God. So God said, I won't have anything to do with you. That's terrifying, if you really think about it. That the thing that we think would be most best for us, but is actually the worst, God would say, I'm sending you message after message, prophet after prophet, teaching after teaching. You really don't want to listen? You're going to learn in the school of hard knocks. 
I'll let you know what life looks like removed from my presence. Whoa. Sit, that should give you pause. For some of us, we go to this place where we go, why doesn't God just deal with it all? Just done. No more rebellion. No more sin. No more evil and darkness. He can do it. Absolutely he can do it. He actually did it once before. In Genesis 7 and 8. We call it the flood. Anytime we have a, an issue or discrepancy with this idea of God, why don't you just intervene right away and deal with evil all at once? God has shown us what that looks like. That has to get rid of all of it. Because none of it's good without him. God has emphatically shown us what life looks like, both left to our own devices, to an ultimate end, but also that slow, progressive being given over and dealt with to other spiritual beings who are not Yahweh, who Psalms, in the book of Psalms, very clearly says, is the Lord of hosts. Like in Psalm 59. Why is he not just the Lord of hosts? Singular. Why is he the Lord of hosts? Plural. If there aren't hosts, if he's not ruler over them all, if they're not subject to him, if they're not more powerful than him, if they're not actually trying to rebel against the one who they know is over them. And so concretely, what does this look like? Because this is a little weird. Are you telling me, Tommy, that there are places on the planet that are not in Yahweh's control? No. But are there places on the planet that are dedicated to other things that are not Yahweh? Absolutely. This seems like a weird spiritual concept, but I can give you one easy, clear example that in your minds will help you know this is something you've come up against. No one would believe that a brothel is dedicated to God. No one would believe that the headquarters of a human trafficking ring or a sex trafficking ring would belong to God. Is Yahweh mighty in that place? Absolutely. Can he work his miracles and wonders? He can and he does. But do you think for a minute that people in that land want anything to do with their God? No. Let us not be blind to the reality that has actually always been in front of us that Scripture is trying to get us to understand. This idea of the spiritual realm breaking in and commingling has always been happening. Let me give you two examples. Exodus 3, where Moses is meeting with God. For our youth group students, they got a sticker about this a week or two ago. It's the burning bush where God reveals his personal name, the I am that I am. This is who I am. God says to Moses, do not come here. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place on which you stand, are standing is holy ground. Now, you, re you read that and you go, well, okay, this is like a, a cool reverence thing that God is asking of Moses. Take your sandals off your feet because God is here. Except that's not what Scripture says. Take your sandals off your feet because you're in the presence of the Almighty. True, applicable, valid, not what Scripture says. Take off the sandals off your feet because where you are is holy ground. Yes, this dirt and this border is fixed owned, kept, protected, and secure by me, Yahweh, on the mountain of God, which is where they meet. Okay, cool, maybe not buying it, no problem. <laughs> I've been waiting for this moment, all sermon. <laughs> Second Kings 5 is a very interesting passage in the Bible. Israel has been split into two countries, the north and the south. They consistently are being ransacked and at war with other countries. One of them is Syria. Not Assyria. Syria. S-Y-I-S-Y-R-I-A. In 2 Kings 5, we see that one of the top army commanders in Syria has leprosy. An incurable, infectious skin disease. It would have made him not able to walk in certain places. It literally would have made him removed from much of public and service. And he's still an army of the commander, so whatever the Syrians are believing, whatever. But he wants healing. He doesn't want to be a leper anymore. And so he goes and he looks for healing. But he finds none in the country that he calls home. And it's until a little slave Israelite girl that is in, under his possession, unfortunately, from one of the raids that they did into Israel, says to her, there's a mighty prophet in my homeland. Ask him. Ask him to see what our God, Yahweh, can do about this. And so he goes. Friends, don't miss the significance of that. That's like waking up tomorrow morning and reading headline news that the top Russian general went to Ukrainian doctors. 
you'd be like, what? He walked straight into enemy land. He walked into land that within living memory, they ransacked, they abused, they terrorized, they killed, murdered, and slaughtered. And yet there he goes. And he meets with Elisha, and he has, brings all these gifts to try and convince Elisha. Beg the favor of your God to heal me. Elisha doesn't even meet with him. He says, just go in the river. And Naaman, the sick army commander, is affronted. What? You won't even meet with me? Do you know who I am? Do you know what I've brought you? I have rivers like this back home. Are our rivers not as good as your rivers? Is he talking about water quality? No! You don't think that my God can move through the river and heal me like your God says you can in your rivers? And Elisha says, that's what you got, man. Go in the river or not. So the choice is up to you. <laughs> Elisha does not care. <laughs> and so he goes. And he and he comes out of those waters, reporting back to Elisha's servant, saying, now I know there is the only God, and he is in Israel. Okay, cool story. But then you get to 17, after he's healed, and he says, please let me, your servant, be given as much dirt as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. Why in the world does this guy want Jewish dirt? Seriously, think about it for a second. What a weird thing. When I had my doctor's appointment for my ankle injury that I sustained a week and a half ago, I didn't suddenly get off the phone to the doctor, hey, where do you live? I just want some of your dirt. That's weird. It is. We can say that out loud. That's just weird, except something very much more serious is going on underneath the surface. Because Naaman, even all the way in a country that does not follow Yahweh, that does not know their oral history, that has not experienced, seen, or been told the tales of the miracles of Yahweh done for the people of Israel, he's privy to none of that. Even he is aware that, this, that the land that he lives does not belong to Yahweh, but it belongs to an imposter. And he can't go home unless he brings real home with him. He can't go back to sacrificing offerings to a fake god. We would call that a demon that wants to take the place of Yahweh. He can't do that. And he's so compelled by this reality, he needs to take dirt so that he can go home and literally... <laughs> okay, now I can pray to God. You don't think God can hear him if he's in Syria? Of course he can. But when he kneels down on that dirt, he knows he's in Yahweh's territory. God lives here. God rules here. God reigns here. It's why when we read Psalm 2, we talk about why do the nations rage? And you go on down that passage, and David, the writer of that psalm, records a very interesting moment between God the Father and God the Son. It has nothing to do with David. And God the Father says to God the Son, ask for what you will and I will give it to you. And what does God the Son, Jesus, ask for? That the nations would be my inheritance. Go and read it. Psalm 2. Why is Jesus asking for the nations? He's very mightily declaring, you all wanted to walk away. I'm not letting you. I will not let you be tricked, fool, imprisoned, or enslaved by the thing that has your doom in store. I am coming, he says. And this will all be mine again. I am coming to set people free. I am coming so that this weird, awkward reality with dirt, and how do you explain that when you get back home, and all that kind of stuff is a pipe dream. It, not, it no longer is because every dirt, every plank, every type of material that we would ever walk on definitively knows on earth as it is in heaven, this is Yahweh's. And it always will be. And it always will be. Our fourth point, friends, why do we just talk about territorial spirits and dirt and where land borders are and all of that kind of jazz? It's because when God uses his people to set up those stones, it's not where they just came from, it's where they're going. They walk into Canaan. They don't own Canaan yet. It's the promised land. It's not actually under their control yet. 
So you want to know what happens when they take stones out of the Jordan River, the waters that represent hell and death, they take them out, which should not be possible, and they mark it on land that does not belong to them? This is what they're saying. Yahweh is coming. Yahweh is coming! You better be afraid. Not us. Them. You better be afraid. These stones stand as a war declaration. Yahweh is coming. He's coming to overcome the evil and the darkness and the sin and the death. He is coming. And nothing will stop him. What does that sound like? But Jesus. Right? It's the thing we celebrate every Easter. When God went to the tomb, overcame death and hell and grave and sin, and said, here I am. You thought you beat me. Joke's on you. Part two. Let's go. <laughs> like, uh, right? Like, these stones, I know, friends, it seems crazy. I know, friends, it's like, can we stop talking about that spiritual stuff? It doesn't, I, I get it. I do. I really do. For a long time in my life, I was there too. Honestly. But we dare not miss what Jesus is trying to teach us. The spiritual act of declaration that says, my life does not belong. The people in my life do not belong. The world I will walk in does not belong to anyone but you, Yahweh. It has always been yours, Jesus. I declare that now and forever. Nothing will ever take that. Nothing will ever change that. Nothing will ever overcome that. And nothing will ever sequester me or imprison me or enslave me again. I am yours, Jesus. Friends, the cross was not just the most beautiful sacrifice that Jesus could have done for us. It was war. Jesus took to task the things that would have kept us from him. And by God's grace, he won. We see that play out again here with these stones on the land that is not theirs yet. Yahweh is coming, those stones say. And friends, we must declare war as well. We must. I don't know about you, but the, I don't remember if it's Ecclesiastes or Lamentations. I'm pretty sure it's Ecclesiastes. But it says, with more knowledge comes more sorrow. The more that your eyes are opened and made aware of the things of how life actually seems to be going underneath the, people, the gaze of the people who walk day in and day out, the more that sorrow seems to threaten because you realize, wow, this world is more screwed up than I ever thought it was. <sighs> Imagine when you get to a place where you realize, like Paul says in Ephesians, the enemy of my soul is not flesh and blood. And from the moment I was in utero, an embryo. It has spent every waking moment wanting to see me die. The purpose of these stones, friends, to remember, to witness, or to instruct, to witness, and to declare. So here's what we're going to do. You got a rock when you came in. If you didn't, go get one when I'm done talking. <laughs> But I'm going to invite you to meditate for a minute or so, the more if you need it. There's, this isn't a homework assignment. There's no rush. We're not checking who, put, you know, who did what with the rock. No. But to remember, how has God been faithful in your life? Some of us remember. Some of us, even when I started talking about that, it came up. You want to know how God is so cool? Yesterday when we had our men's breakfast, this was one of the points that Scott, who gave the Devo, talked about. Scott didn't know what I was talking about. Literally. And yet, boom, there it was. How has God been faithful with your life? Friends, if you don't remember, that's okay. Sometimes it leaks. Ask him. You don't think God can cause you to supernaturally remember? So that you may praise him for it? But who in your life is God calling you to instruct and about who he is? I worded this question very, very clearly. Not, is God calling me to instruct? There is no question that the spiritual instruction of the generations that precede us is our responsibility. And because it is our responsibility, God will make it happen. He's not giving us a task that is too large for our britches to bear. But who in your life is God is calling you to instruct about who he is? Let's take this seriously, friends. Let's take this seriously. I had a, I had a friend of mine tell me once, everyone on the planet who knows anything about Jesus in the, in the modern world knows Billy Graham. Who is Billy Graham's youth pastor? Not a single one of you can name him. But Billy Graham, youth, Billy Graham does not exist without his youth pastor. Well, really without Jesus, but 
You get, the, you get the idea here. Has God met with you today? Bear witness to his presence. Bear witness to his presence. If you have walked into this building or tuned in online and something was just off, something was not okay, you just carried in with weight, but you have sensed the stirring of the Spirit as he has revealed Jesus to you, bear witness to that. If it wasn't today, remember again. And bear witness, Jesus, you have met me there when I had that surgery I wasn't expecting. You did meet me when my loved one died unexpectedly. You did meet me in the celebration of my kid graduating. You were there, you were there, you were there. Help me to bear witness to you, Jesus. Help me to have it overflow out of my mouth to anyone who will listen. God, you were there. You were there. But also, are you ready to fight? Because he's been fighting for you on, on your behalf all this time. Friends, how often are we going to wake up and see the sin in our lives, the problem in our lives, the situations in our lives, do our darndest to try and fix it, and let our heads hit the, pill let our heads hit the pillow at the end of the night, realizing nothing has changed. Are you not sick of that awful cycle? Are you not sick of living in a world that just seems to be getting more damaged? That's not what Scripture says. Jesus is the one who quotes Isaiah and says, I've come to set the captives free. I've come to make on earth as it is in heaven. I've come to make every footprint of this realm mine again. Are we not seeing that happen in our midst? Because if you're not, then ask him to do that. But be ready, because when he's going to do that in your life, he's not going to call you to be a bystander. God is not some coach starting his team, letting you sit on the bench and say, just watch. He's saying, no, I want to do this with you. So come on, show up to practice. Let me teach you. Let me make a way. And then even as all of you fumble and can't win the game, watch how I do it anyway. But we did it together. Not because God is somehow missing us. Not because somehow God needs us, but he wants us. Are we ready to fight? Are we ready to do what must be done to see the spiritual realities in our lives break and change? Are we ready to get into disciple groups like we've been talking about? To actually be vulnerable and dive into community? Are we willing to actually take the study of the word seriously? And not just, in, just flip and I No, to actually dive in deep into what God is wanting, to, wanting us to know. Are we willing to take seriously prayer and all the different ministries under prayer? Seeking the Lord's face together so that we may see him. Why else would God tell us to seek him unless we can find him? Whew. I'm out of breath. <laughs> I'm going to leave this up there for you. Yeah, worship team, you can come up. And here's what we're going to do. As you meditate, I'm willing to bet that not just one, but multiple of these will stick out to you and God wants to speak to you about it. And when you're ready, you take that rock. That act of faith. It's not just an object lesson. It's not just a cool interactive thing we get to do at church today. Take that rock. And this Ebenezer is going to be right in the middle. And trust that this is going to be true in your life. And you want it to be true in your life. And you are sensing how Jesus is coming for you to make this true in your life. And declare with your actions, God, I trust you. And I will build a memorial stack unto your name today. That my life and the lives of all those around me, before, during, and after, may be different and may be marked by your presence. So that I'm one step closer to receiving that sweet inheritance. All this is going to be possible, friends. All this is going to be necessary to make that inheritance possible. Let's pray. Jesus, you are good. And your love endures forever. Thank you that your love endures forever. Jesus, meet with us. That's simply the cry of my heart in this moment. Meet with us, Jesus. Holy Spirit, remove the things that block us from you. Remove the numbness, the apathy, the indifference, the anger, the fear, the control, the anxiety, the depression, the everything. Anything that wants to stand in the way, Jesus, we remove it in your name. Jesus, come and meet with us. Come in part in a deep, indescribable way into our hearts and souls. The very power and purpose of these stones. These stones aren't magical. This is some weird new age philosophy practice or nonsense like that. But it's simply echoing what you have called our ancestors to do and to build a memorial stone stack. Say, God, I will remember. God, I will instruct. God, I will bear witness. And God, I will fight as you are fighting alongside me. Jesus, come and do that now. We need you to come do that now. Otherwise, this is pointless. Come, Lord Jesus for our good 
but ultimately for your glory.